Good evening and welcome to this special Anzac Day edition of The Nation. We are coming to you from within the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, in the Anzac Hall, no less. And we've brought together a range of different perspectives tonight to look at Anzac Day, why it holds such a special place for Australians. The Director of the Australian War Memorial, Brendan Nelson, also a former Defence Minister during the Howard Government, Major General Jim Molan is a retired army officer who served in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor and in Iraq as the Chief of Operations for the multinational force there. Peter Fitzsimons is a journalist and author who has brought to life some of Australia's most significant military achievements in his books Kokoda and Tobruk. And Major Matina Jewell is a former army officer and peacekeeper, an ambassador of Australian peacekeepers and a member of the Anzac Centenary Commission. Welcome to you all. I want to start with the simple question. Why is Anzac Day so special to Australians? I mean, other countries do honour and revere uh, their military members, their war history. But here in Australia, this has really become the day, hasn't it? More, more so than Australia Day, I would argue, of, of national significance. Jim Mullen, perhaps uh, you could start with your thoughts on why Anzac Day is what it is. David, I think it's got something to do with the fact that you never stop building a nation. And uh, I've served in lots of countries which are coming from not much and trying to build into modern nations, but modern countries like Australia still must build. And we have a military history that you can't jump over. And uh, it's essential that each and every generation comes to terms with that military history. And it's not being militarist or anything like that to come to terms with, with, with what our predecessors have done in Australia. I think it's got something to do with that. I can't fully explain the fascination of young Australians now for Anzac Day and for going to Gallipoli, but uh, you wouldn't knock it. Well, no, and we'll, we'll explore that. But uh, Peter Fitzsimons, what do you think? We're not a warlike nation, no. and we are a long way from some of the global hotspots. Why, why do we get into Anzac Day so I agree much? with Jim, to begin with, that our record, our military record, is a very honourable one, that we don't have a My Life, for example, on our, on our record. We don't have atrocities. But I think that First World War, four and a half million people, and we lost 60,000 mm. dead. 60,000 dead. Which on our population number at the time it, was exactly. a big, big and number. Exactly, and it was such a, such a thing that it's in our DNA, so that every town, every community lost one, two, three, you know, families wiped out. And that, that I heard the stories from, from my father and I tell them to my children. And it, it's just, it's, it's in us somehow. And I think that when, it, when you go to Gallipoli, and the first time I went there, I was a footballer playing rugby in Italy, and I, I got there in 1984, and I, my strong feeling was that I'm on sacred Australian soil overseas somehow. Mm. That it, it's somehow, it, it's DNA somehow. And I, it's hard to define it, but it's there. Martina, you've served with um, officers from other countries. Uh, and as I say, other countries do respect and honour their, um, their, their military history and their, their military members. Is it something different in Australia, really? Yeah, I think it is something really quite different and unique to Australians. And certainly trying to explain to um, my United Nations um, colleagues that in Australia we actually commemorate one of our biggest losses uh, of Gallipoli. And trying to explain that to some of the Chinese and Russian uh, peacekeepers that I was serving with, that was a very foreign concept and I guess it's kind of almost unique uh, to our Australian character in a sense that we really pause and reflect and commemorate um, the loss of so many lives on, on one of our biggest um, operations overseas in World War One. May I just add to that? It just, it is, you mentioned Kokoda and Tobruk. It is staggering that in the Second World War, our forces were the first to stop. So, so, so the, the Germans, 5th of September 39, into Poland and on and down and through, and they go all the way through Europe and they get to North Africa. First time they stop, the Australians stop them just outside of Tobruk and then hold them off. So that was the first reverse for the German land army. Japan, 7th of December 41, bombing. Pearl Harbour, Philippines, and on and on and on. First time they stopped, the Australians stopped them at... Uh, at uh, not Kokoda, but Milne Bay. Milne Bay. 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 Mil Bay. So on our record is Australians were the first to stop the Germans and the Japanese, seriously aggressive nations doing the wrong thing. And yet it is odd that we say, yeah, yeah, but did we tell you about the time we invaded peaceful Turkey? <laughs> <laughs> and we suffered some losses. And we lost 9,000 of our men. Yeah, but Brendan Nelson, tell us, and it's not all about Gallipoli, Anzac Day, but why is this, um, this battle in particular so important to Australia? Historically, well, it, it's interesting. I think it's it's who we are, uh, as we've just heard from these three uh, and their 
23 million Australians now and you'll get 23 <laughs> mi million different opinions <laughs> about what it all means. 11, and 11, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's who we are. We're a people we, we haven't been invaded. Uh, we're not natural aggressors. We have an extreme distaste for war. We're relentlessly in pursuit of peace and sending peacekeepers throughout the world to make and enforce peace. But essentially, we are also people who've inherited a spiritual legacy from the Gallipoli landing right through to what we mm. see in Afghanistan today of courage, endurance, the, the concept of selfless determination to help one another. And, uh, you know, of all of the stories out of the First World War, part myth and part truth, the Simpson and his donkey, the idea of a guy basically putting himself in harm's way at mm. risk of losing his own life to help uh, his mates, essentially. Uh, it's that kind of ethos and I think uh, I'm 54 I think I'm the member of the last generation of Australians that was given a pre-packaged set of values God King and country this is the way your life's going to be young people today are increasingly finding their sense of belonging and meaning in being an Australian in our military history not in the fighting but rather in the values that w we found and saw in most not all of those men and women who've, who've gone in but, our name. Jim Mullen this this day hasn't always had the place in our national psyche that it that perhaps has today. Um, when, when did Anzac Day become what it is? Uh, because presumably after World War One uh, and perhaps even after immediately after World War Two it, it wasn't what it was today. No it, 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 it wasn't but there was an extraordinary series of events in the 20s uh, as the soldiers who, who only a few years ago were, were fighting and bleeding on the Western Front. Mm. It were, Anzac Day was used for sectarian reasons. There's a great photograph of Archbishop Mannix with all the Catholic Victoria Cross winners leading a, mm. uh, a march mm. in, in Melbourne. And, and it was done obviously for sectarian reasons at that stage. But it's gone up and down. I think in, in, in our memory where it's gotten, gone down may, may have been during the Vietnam War. Uh, where so much was taken out on the participants uh, because of the Vietnam War uh, and uh, uh, therefore I think it went down then and, and we, we see this in America as well. Uh, th there seems to be a guilt associated with this which may be causing us to, uh, to overcompensate to a certain degree and you see that on the streets in the US every day you're over there. I would say it started to resuscitate basically in the John Howard years. I, I remember mm. 90, 96, 97. Maybe East Timor, Peter. Maybe, but I remember taking, suddenly thinking out of, out of the blue, I think I'll take my kids to Anzac Day. Got them up before mm. dawn and we went and I think uh, we were expecting maybe 10,000 people, there were 50,000 in the mm. sense that there was a sudden surge. And well, I don't what, know what, what John about, Howard fitting with our yeah. head or not. What, what about <laughs> you specifically, Peter? I mean, you know, you have taken that interest to a, a whole mm. other level with uh, the, 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 well, the books that you've written, but what sparked it for you? Well, wh one thing, I mean, I wrote a book on Nancy Wake, the mm. White Mouse, the most decorated heroine of the Second World War, and honestly, I thought it would sell, and the publishers <coughs> thought it would sell five or 10,000, and it sold 200,000. And that there was a sudden surge of interest in partly she was a female war hero um, you know so there were so many sort of males that, that were celebrated not so many females but uh, I like most Australians before I started writing the book on Kokoda and Tobruk you know Kokoda New Guinea I think we did pretty well you get into it it's a fantastic story it's unbelievable and it now has become yeah. such a, um, a destination along with Gallipoli yeah. For young right Australians passage. and mm -hmm. older Australians to go and trek, I've done it myself. It's, Have you? Um, it's one of the you know after reading your book. It's good <laughs> on your <face. laughs> I think uh, I think Jim and Peter are making a very important point. We went through in that Vietnam era. There was a Anzac Day was falsely portrayed as some sort of celebration of war, which of mm. course it mm. isn't. But also the individual stories. Mm. People relate, as we all yes. know, to individual stories. Peter has, has played a significant role in bringing that to life. Mm. So when we talk about you know, 62,000 dead from the First World yeah. War from a population of four and a half million, okay, that has impact. But when someone is telling the story of mm. a certain <coughs> private or corporal or whoever it is in a particular battle and losing his life and the, the impacts on families back at home, that brings it to life. And young people relate to that. I think, I think I can totally agree with what Brendan's saying in that capacity that I think the older generations from World War I and mm. II were reluctant to talk about their experiences and didn't share. Um, from my own experience, my grandfather served in World War II and he very rarely spoke yeah. about his experiences. Mm. And I would have loved, as then a, a serving member and now as a veteran, to have been able to sit down with him um, and to hear him tell those stories. Um, yeah, both my and parents. I think that has changed in, in current and younger generations. Was that, is, is that simply is because the, the, the wounds were still 
it's so very real. Raw to him. Yeah, and, and I think mm. like many of those uh, that era, they really carried yes. the, the wounds of war and battle. And, and why, why was that? Why was that different? That. Because you, 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 I might get you to explain your um, your experiences, because you've been through some shocking stuff as well. I guess I had a fortunate career in, in the military. I served for 15 years and during that time I served on five overseas missions. And it was the last mission uh, that I was serving in the Middle East, uh, this time in Syria and then in Lebanon with the United Nations as a peacekeeper. And unfortunately that mission actually ended my military career uh, as I was right on the border between Israel and Lebanon during the 2006 uh, Israel-Lebanon war. And uh, during that war, after so many near misses um, at my base, at patrol base Kiam, which was right at the junction of those three countries of Israel, Lebanon and Syria, um, after so many near misses there from all types of uh, weaponry, from fighter jets and attack helicopters, tanks and artillery fire, you need to remember we were an unarmed peacekeeping force, we were there to monitor a peace agreement. But within a second, that all changed and went from monitoring peace to being in the, in the you know, the thick of full-scale war around us. And it was an Israeli airstrike in the end that um, hit, hit the base the where base. you were? Yeah, so uh, I was very fortunate that I had been sent off to command a, an armoured vehicle convoy through the war. Fortunately, I was injured during that convoy and, and broke five vertebrae in my back, which ended my military career. Yeah. But just a couple of days later, the base was that I'd been at uh, was bombed by an Israeli fighter jet, uh, a thousand pound bomb, direct hit on the bunker, which uh, tragically killed all of my teammates at the base. See, and, and see, you, you you're able to talk about this, um, I don't know how comfortably, but you're able to yeah. talk about this. I and mean, we're just making that point about the, the generation prior, the prior the really the struggling to do so. I think it, you Is know, that something that you consciously think about uh, and push yourself to, to explain your experience? For me, it was actually a cathartic process in sharing my experiences and I was very driven to ensure that there were positive lessons learnt from my experiences to change and save lives of others. So that was the driving force behind me, sharing my story. Um, but I think also I now sit on the National Mental Health Forum. I think it's actually a healthy environment if you can share those experiences uh, of such horrific situations that uh, anyone who has experienced war firsthand knows how bloody and horrific that situation on the battlefield yeah. is. And we, uh, we should uh, give a wrap for the, where we are, the War Memorial. I mean, mm -hmm. you guys do an amazing job in recording and telling those stories as well. And, and, and that's now a, well, a very important yeah. process. Well, they're extremely important. and. Part of what happened in earlier generations, the veterans who returned felt guilty about surviving and living when they saw so many killed, uh, and not to mention the other horrors of the impact of the war. But also for the Australian War Memorial, listening to Martina, it reinforces the importance of the memorial telling the stories mm. tell and telling them soon not as we did after Vietnam, reflecting society and waiting a period of time before telling the story of the Vietnam experience. We need to tell the story now. We'll be telling Afghanistan this year. We also need to put as much emphasis on peacekeeping and anyone who recently I've had to deal with people trivialising the role of peacekeeping as if it's uh, something that's uh, fairly innocuous and harmless. That, that issue, uh, just listen to what we've just heard. Yeah. Uh, would you rather be in that situation or be uh, fully armed in a, in a bushmaster somewhere? Uh, so part of uh, the memorial's responsibility in my view is not just to educate and inform Australians and prompt them to reflect. It has a therapeutic role mm -hmm. on these veterans. They need to know that they can come here, that they can see, read, hear, and feel something about what they've done. Mm. And can I just add to that? I think it's all very well to say, lest we forget, but we have to provide the means to remember. And so that when you come in here and you see this, this is where you get some aspect of what, what it would have been like. Mm. Absolutely, mm. and you go to the, the Vietnam um, yeah. gallery and it's, it's hard not to feel like yeah. you're right but there. I, but yeah. you see, and I say, David, and this is part of our messaging for Anzac Day has been to reach out to veterans of contemporary conflicts mm. because what I've observed as a non-military person is that the veterans of Solomon Islands, East Timor, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Somalia, Rwanda, they quietly go to the dawn service but very few participating in marches which is why we had Ben Robert Smith come here and march to say to young veterans this is for you no less than it is for veterans mm. of early well, conflicts. Well that brings us to the issue of who marches and who should march and who shouldn't march. This um, is annually a, a debate about uh, whether the family should march, or they march at the back of the pack or, uh, next to their, um, their, their family member who served. Um, should it be broadened out to other fields like 
uh, volunteer bush firefighters and lifesavers. Mm. Um, uh, Jim Mullen, what do you think? Who should march on Anzac Day? Uh, I, I think you've got to limit it to, to the veterans. The, the veterans must get priority. This is where it came from and, and there are plenty of veterans around. I, I saw the figures today of the number that have served in Afghanistan and they've slipped my mind entirely, but it's a big number. Yeah, 25, mm. That's it, that's it. Uh, a very impressive number. Mm. Uh, so we will have veterans, if we can encourage them to participate in, in the marches, we won't be short of people to, to commemorate Anzac Day. But should there be, you know, if, if you know, my grandfather served in PNG, mm. he's no longer here, um, should I be able to march no. on no, his behalf? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I, I'd, I'd agree with Peter. I, if you've got a compromise, there are ways of compromising mm. that. And I'm a great compromiser. But uh, I would like to start the argument by saying this is a day for veterans uh, and, and the families of veterans uh, stand on the side and, and applaud what they've done. Well, I, I grew up as a little boy. Both my parents served in the Second World War and we would go to Sydney and they would march down George Street and there was my dad and there was my mum and we'd wave and it would never occur to me 20 years, 30 years, 40 years later for me to march with those few I'll remaining because I didn't, I didn't serve. And it's, it is wonderful somehow when you see grandkids you know, proudly marching and you want that, but yeah. it loses the focus really of those who served. Yeah. Matini, do you, do you march on Anzac Day? Yes, I do. And I guess uh, while serving, uh, it's in, I think it should be encouraged that serving members march on Anzac Day and as many as possible. Mm. So I think part of the issue is that serving members actually see themselves not as veterans, actually, until they retire from the Defence Force. You're not Force. old enough to be a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> I get told that every Anzac Day, Peter. And how do you <laughs> feel I'm wearing about... wearing my father's medals on the wrong side. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about family members um, taking part? Well, look, I, I really encourage anyone who wishes to participate in Anzac Days to be involved in, in the capacities that they would like to participate. So I'd hate to see stifling of, of uh, people being involved within the ceremonies. But I think I agree with Jim and, and Peter and that on this issue that veterans need to be the priority on, on these marches, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the, the city services where the, the marches, there's so many veterans marching that literally to get through the veterans and, and current mm -hmm. serving members, it, you're hours into a parade before family members can, can join in anyway. So if it has to be sort of a negotiation, potentially yeah. in, in small communities and rural areas where there is an option to, right. for yeah. family members to be involved, then sure. but, but, but yeah. I, I believe personally that for, for the big parades, it should be just the veterans and serving members. Now, in uh, a couple of years' time, of course, comes the centenary of um, the Gallipoli landing, and this, this will be a huge national moment and much of the um, activity will be happening uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Um, the, the fact is, not everyone who wants to go can go mm. to this, uh, but critics say the government should not stop people who want to go, and, and particularly those who've already prepaid to go, being able to attend. Peter? It's, it's a simple public safety <laughs> issue. You cannot, it can bear about 10,000 people. You know, in the main site, you cannot have 25,000 or 30,000 people there. Mm. You therefore have to have a means of fairly limiting it. What is fairer than a ballot? So it's absolutely luck. It's not who's, who's wealthy, who's poor, who's, who's whatever. Mm. You just say, we'll have a ballot and we'll choose 8,000 Australians and 2,000 uh, Kiwis to be there and it will be sad for those who really want to be there who will miss out but what what better way? And, and as you would know from being from going there and yeah. seeing it, it, it it's a very fragile uh, site. I was there last month and when you go for example when you go to for me the most moving place is where the Battle of the Neck took place on mm. the 7th of August and it's well it's always described as a tennis court it's actually half a football field but you can't have 10,000 people there. You can't, you could have two or 300 in safety, but you've got trenches, you know, like the yep. original trenches there. You've got the Lone Pine cemeteries just over there. You, you can't, you can't have people sleeping out among that. It's got to be some, under some control. And you imagine if the Japanese had invaded, let's just say, in 1942, and hit Bondi Beach and left 10,000 soldiers behind. We can't have, we could, would we have 100,000 Japanese crowding <laughs> on the Bondi Beach? I mean, it, the, it, the Turks have got some say in it too. And this is, as you say, it's a fragile environment. It's a sacred environment. It's not for a rock concert. Uh, Brendan Nelson, do you think this is, uh, you can understand that the, the argument yeah, put yeah, there, but yeah. will people accept that? 
I think they do. Look, we're Australians, and on Anzac Day, we've been reflecting on what it all means and what it means to be an Australian, and we get it. In fact, around the RSL clubs and other places today, they've all been playing two up and the mm -hmm. like. We, we get the idea of odds and having a ballot. Uh, I think Tom Waterhouse was there, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> but, there's one, but there's something else too. Look, I, I was privileged. John Howard asked me when I was Defence Minister to go to Gallipoli in 2007. Mm -hmm. I spent a week writing three speeches, six minutes each, and I, I said to John Howard when I got back, whatever happens to me in my future life, nothing will exceed the experience in honour of that. But to be perfectly frank with you, the best time to go to Gallipoli is not mm. Anzac Day. It's to wander around those cemeteries, yep. yeah. read the epitaphs, look at the headstones, reflect on the landscape, yep. where the guys came yeah. from. Six months before they got there, they were butchers, bakers, shop assistants and the like. And as far as the, the ballot goes, the one thing that's really, it's a family show, so I better keep my language <laughs> straight, but one thing that's really annoyed me recently, these people that have prepaid, you know, pre-sold these, right, these right, tours yeah. and all this sort of stuff, mm. they are saying, oh, it's un-Australian for the government and bureaucrats to decide who's going to go. In my view, whatever the Anzac legacy means to any of us, it's not about saying, oh, well, if you've paid your money and you've bought a ticket and someone's, uh, you know, sort of turning something out of it, that you're going to get priority over somebody else. I think mm. Peter's absolutely right. We understand the idea of a ballot. There's a limit to how many people you can put in there, and this is the way to go. And as you say, you, you, you do on the centenary of Lone Pine, you do on the centenary yeah. of, the, of, of the Battle of the yeah. Neck, you do it on the centenary of the evacuation. I mean, there are so... The, the so everyone can get a... Yeah. Or yeah. well, more people can get a chance. Yeah. But Jim Mom, do you worry that this whole centenary thing could turn into a bit of a circus? Over there. Oh, I, 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 if, as, as long as they as long as they control it from our end, I don't think it will. Uh, we've seen tendencies towards a rock concert, concert mm. attitude in the past, and that's but that seems to have gone away last year from from what I could see on TV. I don't yeah, know whether has, you were there, but uh, I, I, th there's an awful lot of war to come. Mm. This is not just the mm. centenary right. of, of, <laughs> of Anzac and Gallipoli. This is the centenary of Hamill and some mm. extraordinary yeah. battle. And may I raise future. one point? That Peter Brune, who's a terrific writer from Adelaide, who wrote Ragged Bloody Heroes, among others, I can't do justice to the eloquence <coughs> of his remarks in his foreword, but he made the point, and it's a really significant one, that it's so arbitrary that if you died at Gallipoli or you died at Fromel or you died at Kakoda or Tobruk, you're revered because you died in a famous battle. His point was there are so many diggers lying forgotten mm. in a lost ditch somewhere mm. who are every bit as brave, who gave their lives just with, as much. Uh, and deserve every bit as, as much reverence as those who happened mm. to die on the beach on the 25th of April 19th. We've got to take a break. Uh, we're then going to look, stay with us, we're going to look at the nature of warfare, how it's changed uh, over our military history. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're coming to you from the Australian War Memorial this Anzac Day and we're talking to the uh, former Defence Minister in the Howard Government, now Director of the Australian War Memorial, Brendan Nelson. Major General Jim Molan is a retired Army officer who served as Chief of Operations for the multinational force in Iraq. Peter Fitzsimons, journalist and author of books such as Kokoda and Tobruk, also a member of the War Memorial Council. And Major Martina Jewell, former Army officer and peacekeeper and an ambassador of Australian peacekeepers. And we are here in the Anzac Hall of the uh, Australian War Memorial. It's a privilege to uh, be here and to be discussing some of these issues this Anzac Day. I want to turn to the, the very nature of warfare because as you can see from the ex exhibitions not just in this hall but around the War Memorial the, the nature of warfare has changed dramatically since the days of the, the Light Horse Brigade <laughs> through to mm. the sort of drone attacks that we uh, see in modern warfare today. Um, Jim Mullen, has that meant a different type of person has been required in the Australian military or is it still regardless of technology whether you're on horseback uh, or in a, a fighter jet it's the same type of Australian that is that is used and is useful in war I, I think there is an Australian characteristic which which uh, means that our ability to produce soldiers is, is sailors airmen and women yeah. Uh, is quite extraordinary and, and quite unique. Uh, and that is a, a, a lack of respect for authority. There is a questioning of authority uh, 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 and a, a relaxed attitude mm. towards discipline in things that aren't important. And is that good? 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> in modern warfare, the last thing you want is someone who unquestioningly yes. obeys every order. The only order I have unquestioningly obeyed all my life is duck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm prepared to go that far, yeah. but what we should respect is soldiers who say, listen, boss, we've done that three times, it hasn't worked on those occasions, yeah. why are we doing it and, again? Uh, yeah. And we, we produce that. And you see a lot of countries in the world, uh, 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 Western societies, US, UK, Australia, uh, produce it much better than many other societies throughout the world and, mm -hmm. and it really is a strength of our society I think. Mm. It's funny, when I was Defence Minister, uh, people would often we say We did what you said, I think. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes very <laughs> obedient to you, uh, mostly. But uh, when I was Defence Minister, people would often say to me, uh, we've been lucky, Australians have been lucky, and I'd say, yeah, of course, we have had some luck. But it's much more than that. Mm. I've, I've found the quality of the leadership at all levels was stunningly impressive. Mm. The equipment, notwithstanding the odd gripes we get, the equipment that's provided to our troops is excellent. The quality of the training is, is extensive and it's deep. But there's something about the Australian character. Mm. And I noticed these young diggers, 20 years of age, they would see themselves not just as soldiers, but as aid workers, diplomats, mm. teachers. They, they, they go to these countries, uh, it, it, I'd see them in East Timor, Iraq or Afghanistan, and they, instead of turning up and saying, well, here we are, we're Australians, mm. they, they'd turn up and they'd have a deferential, respectful attitude to the culture of the place wherever they were. They'd want to basically understand what was going on and how other people would think. Do you, do you think that, that that's always been the case, Peter? Oh. In, in Vietnam, a Korea where there were big cultural differences, young men going into. They've engaged these. well with the local population, and the the thing I would add is adaptability. That they adapt to the terrain yeah. in in which they are. Yeah. In fact, you said earlier, and I don't want to open this can of worms. You yeah. said Australia's never been invaded. Our indigenous population may not agree, but I won't, <laughs> well, I, I, I won't I open that. that. Yeah, but, right, but, no, but, but my point is that having come for the European population to come here, we had to adapt, we had to. There was no problem so great that enough elbow grease and fencing wire couldn't fix it in the short term. And I think that that is a strain through Australia's military history and adaptability of rolling their sleeves up and getting onto it. The line that I love, you talked about the wildness in the, well, in the First World War. I mean, they burnt down, our, our blacks burnt down the brothels of Cairo. And they were, they were hell on earth. And the story that I love is in 1940, so the war breaks out in September, we send our first lot over to the Middle East to train. And the plan was to have them in training camps outside Cairo. And as the ship comes up the, the canal, um, a little ship, mail ship comes out from the Cairo government and it's got a message and it says we still remember the aftermatch party in 1918. <laughs> we are not having Australia. You can go to Palestine. You, you are not coming to Cairo. Yeah. Go out there where you won't do, do damage. Yeah. What, what is the reputation that Australians have when, when you go in somewhere or when you did go in somewhere? Was there something that was expected? I think the Australian Defence Forces are held in very high regard uh, around the world. I think we've got a very good history mm. and record uh, of our involvements uh, in, in wars, conflicts and peacekeeping operations. And, and gladly I think today that our current servicemen and women are really maintaining and upholding that great record that we have. Let me ask you this. When we look at this uh, change in the nature of warfare, as I, as I said earlier, the use of drone attacks is something I think we're mm. going to see more and more and more of. Will there always be a need, Jim Mullen, for boots on the ground, for soldiers as we know them in uh, warfare of the future? I think there will. I think we will all be uh, well and truly in our graves before you have autonomous robots operating, totally autonomous robots operating on battlefields. Mm. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a single consistent thing, I think, which has gone from warfare at least of the last century and well into this century, and that is that in ultimate practice, uh, warfare is about close combat. Uh, that, that decisions are made on battlefield through close combat. Now, most Australians, if you speak to them, will say, they'll express absolute astonishment that we still fight in close contact. Mm. That, you speak to Ben Robert Smith, and uh, he can tell you that that ain't yep. so. You look at any of the battles that I was involved in in Iraq and in urban terrain, close combat is everything. It but, is but, room but, to room. But Obama, uh, President Obama is certainly escalating the use of um, drone strikes in, in, in Pakistan uh, around the border region. Um, there's no doubt about that. Yes, but I, th I think a lot of the objection to that is, is highly political objection based on a total and absolute misunderstanding of what's going on. If the drones weren't there, there'd be jets doing the job. 
Drones are simply a mechanic. They have no, they're, they're not, we, the, drones is an appalling word. They are remotely piloted vehicles. Mm -hmm. There is a human being flying that sure, aeroplane. Sure, He's just not on board. No, they might be sitting back at home in the Correct. United States. Correct. Um, yeah. So, but, but, so I, I think that the nature of war hasn't changed so much. You know, that, that aeroplane behind you has a pilot uh, uh, just as the current aircraft have a pilot. The next generation of aircraft, well probably there'll be, probably be a pilot somewhere, he might be surrounded by a number but of there, drones. There, there is a difference, isn't there, um, Peter, between piloting a... Mm, I was interested in that, I, had, I, hadn't, I hadn't appreciated that aspect, mm. that, that you, you think it's every bit as much that if there's somebody with their eyes on the ground in Washington, as, as good as having a pilot there, watching what's happening, there are people... Often there are it's people. better. Really? Oh, oh, mm. It is far, far better. The drones that fly throughout the world uh, spend you know 24 hours staring down not only but it's not only one pilot looking down you might have a, a team of 15 people who are taking the video feed from that mm. drone and analyzing yeah. now somewhere there is a boss which says uh, I apply the laws of armed conflict to this decision and we attack or we don't and attack. And we saw it up close in the in the killing of Osama bin Laden. Absolutely. I mean that was an extraordinary situation at a desk like this and the thing that mm. most amazed me, you remember the famous photo? Mm. There was the President of the United States. Mm. He was the guy in the corner, you know, and th remember, remember that? And they were con not controlling, but they were watching from Washington mm. what was happening uh, just outside, well, uh, was it Alabad in, in um, you, you, Pakistan? I'm just uh, returning to the point you just made that um, they have to follow uh, rules of engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't there a big question about whether this is being followed? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I would say to you that the laws, I, I would be confident, knowing the Americans as I do, that the laws of, in, uh, uh, of armed conflict are being followed religiously. Why do you say that so quickly? So, I mean, they weren't fantastically strong on the rules of engagement at Abu Ghraib. Absolutely, uh, uh, because of the simple fact that in the year that I spent running the war in Iraq, that the culture within the US armed forces is to follow the laws. Now, the laws of armed conflict do not prohibit the killing of innocent civilians. Now, most Australians will find that absolutely astonishing, but uh, as long as it is not your intention to target killing, uh, to target innocent civilians, uh, it, the laws of armed conflict provide for the killing of innocent civilians. That, that is a natural consequence as long as it is collateral to what you are doing. And so we get that appalling word. Martina, one thing, um, it seems we will always need are peacekeepers. Um, now, looking at the role of peacekeepers in particular, um, as I think uh, uh, Brenda Nelson might have indicated earlier, there, there has at times been a bit of condescension towards uh, peacekeeping as opposed to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, soldiering. Um, what is the difference? Is it simply that you're not armed? No, I think because there's different categories of peacekeeping. Mm. Sometimes and you're armed, don't you? Uh, sometimes mm. you're armed, sometimes mm. you're unarmed. And I think the difficulty with peacekeeping is that it's very misunderstood, even within military. Um, but, and I think part of that is because there's so much variety within peacekeeping missions and also within day-to-day -day between. If you're on the same mission, one day to the next can be such variety um, in what you're facing on the ground. And so some missions might be relatively um, benign and, and peaceful. Mm. My own experience on UNSA, the United Nations Truce Supervision Organisation in the Middle East, where for that first year working in Syria and then later in Lebanon, um, most days was fairly peaceful environments, benign conditions, but then within a split second it simply changed mm. from monitoring a peace agreement to being in the thick of full-scale war. So it is every that's bit what is makes tough. It so dangerous. Every bit is tough. This for me personally, of the five missions that I served on, this was by far the toughest one because you're in an environment where you're trained to carry weapons and there's all of a sudden this, uh, this pressure and this, uh, particularly during once the war started, this vulnerability where you're trained to actually be, be armed but all of a sudden you're in an unarmed peacekeeper, Is you have no way of defending you yourself. Think, gee, I wish I had a weapon right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, there was plenty of times where you're sort of thinking, I'm so vulnerable here mm. and I have no way I'll of bet. sort of protecting innocent civilians around me in this environment um, mm. where you're also yourself you know, in, in the thick of the war and a sitting duck at Do times. you think Australians recognise and respect what we've done in a peacekeeping role over the years? And I know this has recently been addressed in terms of honouring those Australians who've died in peacekeeping missions on the, uh, the role of honour here at the War Memorial. Do, do people appreciate it now, do you think? 
No, I think there's still just a lack of understanding and I think understanding often comes through through knowledge and, and if some of these stories can be shared and, and people mm. learn the difficulties faced by peacekeepers. Mm. I think for me I needed different skills from the war fighting missions I'd been on previously in the Middle East. This one you well, had more to of use... More a diplomatic skill? You had to have diploma diplomacy. Um, every week I was involved in meetings with mayors and muqtars of the Arab regions that I was serving with. And, and as a white woman in these environments, yeah. uh, thankfully I'd learnt to speak Arabic before I deployed on this mission. There's a whole different raft of skills that, uh, you know, thankfully the Australian soldiers are, are trained so highly that you can adapt and modify, use ingenuity mm. um, to deal with the circumstances you're placed Where's in. Where's the book on this? Well, uh, this is what I was about to say. As somebody who <laughs> tells story for a living, tells stories for a living, I totally respect everything you've done and all the 70,000 peacekeepers have done. But the, the storming of the beaches and up they go and over and they're firing. It's dramatic, you know, and the Holocaust on the one side and our guys on the other. It's dramatic and it's a story that people tell and tell and tell and you make movies about. Your role every bit as va va valuable, in fact more valuable because the peacekeepers do their job. Mm. We don't get to, you know, the war much, much more valuable, but it's not a story that easily grips the imagination. Mm. Yeah, but Brendan Nelson, what... Um what is the War Memorial doing to address this? Well, uh, recently what we've done is we've changed the policy of the memorial. So now, if an Australian government decides that there will be an operation and we send Australian defence personnel on that operation, which is named by the Chief of Defence, and any one of them loses his or her life, whether they're killed or they die, they will go on the roll of honour. And that's retrospective as well, isn't it? It is, back to 1947. Right. So immediately 48 uh, Australian names will go mm. up on the roll of honour. As they should. As they should, including seven peacekeepers, uh, including Peter McCarthy, who was killed with a landmine in 1988 in Lebanon. In Lebanon. But back the same to mission that I was setting up. Yeah. 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 But you Australians may recall in 2006, which was one of the decisions that I, I made, uh, uh, we sent a, a frigate and an LPA off the coast of Fiji. and. Uh, uh, tragically, uh, Captain Mark Bingley, who was uh, piloting the Black Hawk helicopter, uh, came down hard. The helicopter went off the ship and we lost uh, him and we lost uh, SAS Trooper Porter. Mm -hmm. Now, up until recently, they would not have gone on the Roll mm -hmm. of Honour. Because it was a peacekeeping mission. It was non-warlike. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that policy has changed. But in addition to that, uh, the other thing that we're looking at here now is, is expanding the presentation that we have of peacekeeping operations or non-war operations within the memorial itself. We're going to take another quick break and then I want to look at, um, well, a couple of the more recent conflicts, in fact one that's still going, Afghanistan, but also the 10-year anniversary of the uh, Iraq war as well. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are coming to you from the Anzac Hall inside the Australian War Memorial in Canberra this Anzac Day and we're talking tonight to Brendan Nelson. Dr Nelson is the Director of the Australian War Memorial and of course a former Defence Minister in the Howard Government. Major General Jim Molan, a retired Army officer who served as Chief of Operations for the multinational force in Iraq. Peter Fitzsimons, journalist and author of Kokoda and Tobruk and also serves on the board of the Anzac Centenary Advisory Board and Major Matina Jewell, a former Army officer and peacekeeper. It is um, 10 years since the start of the Iraq war and it's been a divisive war from the start and, and, and remains so uh, today. Jim Mullen, you served there as Chief of Operations uh, for the multinational force and I know you've been there, you've been back there recently. Are you able to say what sort of impact the war had on Iraq, uh, was it a setback for the country or do you think this is a, it is a better place? That's a, a really hard decision to make and, and uh, I, I think we may need another five or ten years to be able to say whether this is good or bad. 100,000 Iraqis died as a result of the invasion and the occupation, 4,500 Americans and, and, and many others died and the disruption and the impact was quite extraordinary. Uh, I, I like to try and get it into perspective. You can't have a kind of a double entry bookkeeping system on this. I like to try and get it into perspective. I don't have to justify the invasion of Iraq because I did personally didn't invade Iraq. I went to the counterinsurgency that followed it. Uh, I try to understand why we invaded and I think I do understand why we invaded. Uh, may not have been the smartest decision but we were there when I arrived and to have then backed off having 
occupy the country, having disrupted the systems that existed in the country, um, uh, 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 to have then said, boy, this is tough, let's all go home, would have been absolutely immoral. Mm. I visited there recently and uh, uh, the, the group that I was with kept on saying to people, oh yes, uh, but people in the West question the, uh, uh, the Iraq war because of the lack of weapons of mass destruction. Well, to a man, every Iraqi we spoke to said to us, that's not an issue for us. You got rid of Saddam. Now, it hasn't gone as well as we would have liked it to have gone uh, for a whole, uh, for a thousand r reasons. And I've got to say that I arrived in the second year of the war, which was a really tough year. Uh, 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 but we, we knew we weren't going to create a, a, a light of democracy on the hill anywhere, mm -hmm. that this was going to be an imperfect country going into the future. But the one thing that we did in, in, in Iraq, and I hope we can do it in Afghanistan, is that we've, we, we've torn al-Qaeda from the neck of Iraq so that Iraq can make up its own mind about what future it has. It's just been through an election where in order to vote you had to risk your life and 60% of the population voted. 60% of the voting population voted. And I wish and I wish Iraq well, and I hope you know democracy mm. flowers and the rest. But when you say tore the Al Qaeda from the neck of Iraq, mm. there were no signs that Al Qaeda had had their hands around the neck of Iraq. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but 19 of the 19 bombers on, of 19 September 11 men, I think 18 were from Saudi Arabia. I thought Iraq from the very beginning, to the notion of dropping more bombs on the Middle East to make it a more peaceful place, was ludicrous from mm. the first. It has been a catastrophic action while also respecting those who served. I do respect very much those who served, who did their duty and they went and they served and they did their best and once they're there, you're right not to pull out. But history does not judge Iraq or George W. Bush very well at all. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because that attitude reflects uh, the vast majority of people's attitude. In fact, the invasion lasted, what, three weeks? Yep. The counterinsurgency lasted eight years. What do we focus on? Lack of weapons of mass destruction. But it's a fair uh, when, I was there, when, you're saying, when you're saying we're going in, we're going to do this extraordinary action because it wasn't simply they're there, it was we know where they are. You know, Cheney was saying we know where they are, we're going to go in and get them. Now, for what they did, for the amount of money they spent, for the lives that they lost, in fact, let me reverse that order, for the lives mm. they lost for the, for, on both sides, it was a catastrophic action. Brendan Nelson, people, you, 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 you were the Defence Minister at the time, but you were part I of the was government. I a member of the mm. Cabinet at the time. And it's interesting, Saddam Hussein had been responsible for the deaths, in, in many cases brutally so, of 70,000 people over 15 mm. years, including through two wars. We knew that he did have weapons of mass destruction. In fact, Kevin Rudd himself said, he, yes, of course he, he's got them. The question was, did he still have them? We need to also remember that this was in a post-September 11 world. <coughs> 3,000 innocent civilians had been murdered in New York and Washington, and the United States had been attacked. The Australian Prime Minister at the time was John Howard. He gets a call from a Labor Prime Minister in Britain, Tony Blair. He gets a call from the US President that says, we're going to deal with Saddam Hussein, which side are you on? If Kim Beasley had been in the lodge, what might he have said? We don't know. <laughs> But one thing's for sure, we now know in hindsight that Saddam Hussein was not an immediate threat, but he was an inevitable one. Yeah. In one form or another, that tyrant was going to have sure, to be Sure, I accept with. all that, but we and also then, had at the time, and look, but, Kim Beasley's Labor uh, but Party David, at the time was really concerned about this, and we had plenty of, of people course. saying uh, this intelligence is, is, is dodgy hmm. at the time. Of, of course there was questioning of, of that, and, and I, of course, personally did not see that intelligence, but the judgment was made by our government of the day that we would be a part of it, and we were. And then having done that, the critical mistakes made were the debathification of the Iraqi administration, pulling apart the Iraqi army, bringing in these American contractors to run basic services. And then, uh, in fact, we go back to our earlier discussion about will there be need for soldiers? And not enough soldiers on the ground to actually deal with it, and then very late with Petraeus coming in with a counterinsurgency proposal. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, uh, look, in one sense you can agree with sing to some things that Peter said and certainly some things that Jim has said. It will be with the passage of time that this judgment will be made. But in our country, 
on Anzac Day. Mm. We take for granted the things that are most important to us in our lives, including living in a democracy, being free, Rule being able to express mm. our point Absolutely. of view, and going out to vote. And we complain about voting, mm -hmm. and yet, as Jim mm. reminds us, in Iraq, people risk their lives to vote. Yeah. So, you this know, goes to this goes to really goes to something I think that's very, very important, and that is that um, we we have been out of modern warfare for so long mm. that. Uh, we tend to, uh, we, we in Australia, despite the fact that we value Anzac Day and despite the fact that we have highly trained soldiers, we don't look at Iraq as an example of modern war which we should prepare ourselves for. Iraq and Afghanistan are, 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 are absolutely typical modern wars and sometimes there's a downside for us being so complacent and satisfied with the level of soldiering that we have in the Australian Defence Force because we can produce the best soldiers in the world as long as we've got lots and lots of time and lots and lots of money. Uh, uh, we, won't, we may not always have that. We also do things which are relatively simple on the world scale of fighting and our soldiers do them brilliantly. That's all the government's asking us to do. But the Iraq war, the Afghan war and what we're talking about in the future which is sophisticated joint war fighting perhaps in the oceans surrounding this country uh, th that's what we're spending our money on defence for. Now, we cannot be too complacent about defence in this country. Yeah. Jim, do you think some of that complacency as a society is, is born out of the fact that really it's not since World War II that our yeah. entire nation has mm. been at war? Yes. And so for the majority of Australians, war fighting is seen by a certain pocket of our society, defence members, who mm. actually take care of that oh, for the rest of the nation. It's, mm. it's, it's very hard. It's yeah. very uh, others others yeah. will tune in at times, but it's, it's not front of mind for them. No, no and that very, shows how very lucky very we are. You know, in, I was first elected to Parliament in 1996 to represent Bradfield. In that very first budget in 1996, we cut everything to try and get the budget back into balance, except defence, which was John Howard's personal commitment to defence. I was harangued by people in my electorate, outraged we were cutting everything except defence. Why weren't we cutting defence? In 1999, when we saw what the militia were doing to these Timorese up there, the same people were on the phone <laughs> demanding we send That's the right army up there. You know, it's, it's the nature of us <laughs> as Australians. What, what, about, um, what about Afghanistan? Um, by the end of this year, most of our soldiers uh, will finally be out of there. We will mm. have an ongoing role, of, which is still being worked out and may well include special forces continuing their um, uh, post-2014. Uh, but again, with the passage of time, when history looks back on Afghanistan, and who knows what the place will look like in another 10 years, what presence the Taliban may or may not have uh, by then. Peter Fitzsimons, do you think we're going to look back kindly on this, this uh, war? I, w I went to Afghanistan in December, nominally as sort of entertainment forces for 10 days and you know I've got a closer look as I suppose as you can while staying on the base mercifully. <laughs> I, again I respect all the soldiers that have served over there, the men and women that have served over there. I think Australia has done a great job and when everything I could determine, what people were talking about, reading up on it, is Afghanistan a better place for the Allied forces, coalition forces being there? I'm not sure. And I, I think that one, I'm, I'm less strong on that. I mean, there is a view that Afghanistan was going really well mm -hmm. and then Iraq came along and the, and the focus was fractured and it would have been better to continue Afghanistan through to the end. But there is a combined political will around the world of where it's, it's, we've got to bring, bring them back from Afghanistan. What's going to happen when everybody comes home? Who knows? Yeah. Afghanistan is a vastly better place for ISAF having been there. Vastly Tell us what place. ISAF is again. Uh, the International Security Assistance, Assistance Force. Force. I knew that, that I was just checking with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask my advisor here. It's but but, but it, it, it is better. The question is, will it remain better? That's the question, isn't yes. it? Yes. And, and, and is the political will there uh, on the part of the United States primarily uh, when there clearly is a mood on the part of the Obama administration to, to stop mm. spending money and losing so many lives. It. Bring it, bring can, it. I, can I say one thing? That I'd be interested, Brendan, your view on this, but one thing they told me when I was in Afghanistan, to have a soldier on the ground in Afghanistan for one year is one million yep. dollars yep. and they showed yeah, me true. they took yeah. us to Tarankat at the edge and they were lobbying you know this is the missile range and there are these families just opposite and they told me the story that when they lob the missiles they, they go whoop 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 everybody get back yeah. and then they lob the missiles target practice and then these families run out and yep. get shrapnel the because they can sell it for 20 cents or a dollar now when you have for one soldier on the ground for one year for one million dollars and you are fighting against people that are living on 20 cents a week or a dollar a week or two dollars a week 
Ultimately, I wonder if one of the reasons everybody's pulling back is you simply, even America, can't afford it. Is that a fear? No, it's not. Well, I no. don't think it is at all. <laughs> it's one of the pressures. It's one of the pressures. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and the, the money is very, very important, isn't it? Y yeah, uh, the, the war economy in Afghanistan has been an important part of mm. Afghanistan over the last decade. But you know, again, we've got to think, you know, why did we go to Afghanistan mm. and remain so committed? The United States was attacked, as I mentioned earlier, 3,000 people killed. Just over a year later, we had 88 Australians, normal, everyday Australians, murdered in Bali by three men who trained with al-Qaeda under the protection of the Taliban in Afghanistan. We then had subsequent bombings in our part of the world that killed Australians. Mm. We also went there because it's, it's the right thing to do in terms of making sure mm. that we, we stand up to this global insurgency where these lunatics have hijacked the good name of Islam to build a violent political utopia. And it's interesting, Peter, that the, the families of the soldiers that w have been killed, our soldiers in Afghanistan, mm. the devastation, you, we can only imagine the devastation in those families and the impact on them. But all of them have said, just make sure his death was not in vain. Mm. Finish yeah. the job. Jim Mullen, do, so, do you see parallels between Afghanistan and uh, another divisive war, Vietnam? Uh, th th there are a few parallels, but you wouldn't want to carry them too far. I, I, we came out of Vietnam and we, we, we said to ourselves, which is only partially true, you know, Phuc Thuy, our province was okay when we left it. Mm -hmm. It was the Americans who lost the war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what that guarantees is that you don't critically examine the role of not just the soldiers, but governments. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, the greatest examiners and critis critics of themselves in these wars are the soldiers on the ground. We are brilliant at tactically examining and criticising ourselves and improving it. Where we don't see it is in governmental decisions as to the level of support given to the war, not to the soldiers, that's been perfect, um, but the level of support given to the war and the level of support given to the Allies. Matina, a final word here. Do you think we've learned important lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq? I think there are a lot of lessons that have come from both of those, uh, those conflicts. There can always be more lessons that can be learnt from every single situation of uh, whether it's war, conflicts or peacekeeping operations because I think ideally for, for all veterans the best legacy we can set is that we don't ever need send the need to send our sons and daughters off to more, mm. to more war zones. So there's always lessons that can be learnt in avoiding uh, actually getting into that situation where we're sending our troops uh, to, into battle and to war. Well, we're going to have to wrap things up there. We're uh, right out of time, but it's just been mm. fabulous talking to all of you and a, and a privilege to be here in the Anzac Hall of the Australian War Memorial. Uh, Brendan Nelson, Jim Mullen, Peter Fitzsimons, Martina Jewell, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us this Thank week. You. Thanks for your company as well. We'll be back with a regular edition of The Nation next week. Bye for now.